Okay. Uh, but I, did, I couldn't make this point. This is a, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. It just came out last week. There are 30 articles and 300 pages, and most of them address transitional species in the fossil record. I agree. And uh, I was at the, our <laughs> annual meeting in October. We had about 500 papers presented uh, to 2,000 vertebrate paleontologists, and most of them dealt with the fossil record. So if people think there is not a good fossil record, I suspect they're just ignorant of what we actually have in our museums. Okay, all right. Speak to the weakness issue, please. I think, you know, one, my book that you have there is about a, a neat fossil record, but the big story is the scientific method and how we go about discovering evidence and def deciding what the evidence is. And by emphasizing the scientific method in the TEKS, which you have, then the, the main thing in the scientific method is asking questions. So when you emphasize that science is about asking questions and getting solid evidence to answer those questions, then I don't think we need that strengths and weaknesses in there. Okay. Thank uh, one big problem is a lot of, you know, the paleontology, we were just talking about stasis. Uh, most high school teachers even don't really have a good handle on talking about differences between uh, punctuate equilibrium or stasis or gradualism. Uh, somebody asked about preservation of the fossil record. We've got about five million species on Earth today. Most of them are insects. And the lousiest fossil record we have is from insects. Where I come from, we have 50 species of mosquitoes. And the chance of one of those getting fossilized is very tiny. So there's a, a lot of things you need to know about before you can understand what's missing from the fossil record and what's in the fossil record. Right. Thank you. I think the mosquito thing got David Bradley's attention. I, I fossilize them every opportunity I get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, Ms. Cargill. Could, could you address the, um, you know, how we see fossils of long periods without change and, you know, the, the sudden appearance? Could you sure, one of my favorite enlighten me a little bit on that? One of my favorite groups of fossils that I've worked on are sharks. And modern sharks haven't changed. You know, we don't get soft parts, but we get their teeth. And so if we're lucky, we get a little bit more. Uh, but sharks are very mobile. And when the environment changes in one area because of climate change, they tend to go somewhere else. Uh, so by being very highly evolved and well adapted to the environment you're in, if you can move to that same environment when your local one goes downhill, then you're not gonna have natural selection because they're already kind of selected at the height of where they are. So by being very mobile species, they can kind of escape the forces of natural selection. But it took them a long time to get to that point. If you go back to dinosaur time, sharks were much different than they are in the last 65 million years. In, in your estimate, was that a? Did you hear me earlier when I was given the um, the numbers, the 99.9 percent? .9%, is that a fair estimation? I got that from Why Evolution Is True by Jerry Coiney. It was copyrighted in 2009. On page 23, that's where that figure came from. Yeah, that's, that's when I teach paleontology, that's the number I use, that 99.9% .9 of all species that ever lived have gone extinct. And but they we just, don't the have, fossils haven't been discovered yet? Is that the Yeah, we don't have, a, you know, again, because of biases of fossilization, it's very hard to fossilize a mosquito or a jellyfish. It's much easier to fossilize a dinosaur with great, and discover it later on so, with okay. big bones. I'm just trying to figure out how, so we literally have in hand or we have seen evidence from about one percent of fossils that we think existed and the ones we haven't seen are because they haven't been discovered yet how is that how does that prove but uh, another how, how does that how, how does that justify teaching not allowing our students to know that there are you know that there are all these you know i, I understand that we can teach them that a lot has not been discovered but we're making a lot of assumptions here. To me, that's not interpretation of scientific data, scientifically. It's making a lot of extrapolation, a lot of assumption. I mean, the bottom line is, is that only about 1% has literally been found. And okay. I'm just kind of questioning. Yeah, so, what you, think? so yeah. you know, we have some organisms that we know very little about. Right. Uh, things that lived in mountains aren't gonna be discovered because where they lived, isn't accumulating sediments, so we don't get a record of them. I just, so we stick to the things we actually can find, okay. and we work on that, and we don't guess about what might be. We go out and try to find new and fill in those gaps. Okay. Well, and each like time, you, find, each time you fill in a gap with a new species, then you've created two gaps. 
You know, if you have a, five, a 10 million year old species and a six million year old species and you find an eight million year one in between, now you've got a gap between six and eight and, and eight and 10.